Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming to my talk today. I'm John Diaz, although some of you may know me as Thanos from my last presentation, but I promise no Marvel references in this talk. In fact, I'm going to be talking about beautiful Scala. Because the Scala you can write can be beautiful, and I'm going to talk about how, how you can use beautiful Scala to solve the business problems that you have every single day at your work. So at the very beginning, I'm going to recount the story of Genesis for those of you who, have, who may have heard it before in your past, maybe in your childhood. And then I'm going to give you the Ten Commandments. Maybe not exactly the Ten Commandments you're familiar with, but they're my Ten Commandments. And then finally, for those of you who haven't walked out of the room by that point, I'm going to end with some closing exhortations. So we're going to start at the beginning, the beginning of procedural and object-oriented programming, the beginning of all types of programming, which are not functional programming. And let me be honest here. <laughs> Everything I'm about to say is a complete fabrication, total bullshit. In the beginning, the earth was null and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And God separated the night from the darkness, and he called the night data, and the light functions. To be clear, I'm talking about pure functions and Im immutable data, for those of you who are getting ideas. And God populated the earth with all kinds of life, fish and humans and plants and everything else. And then he thought there's, there's something missing. There's a type of human missing. A type of human who will spend hours debating on the internet the merits of tabs versus spaces, or Emacs versus VI, or even object-oriented programming versus functional programming. So God created the programmers. And God didn't just create one type of programmer, he created two types of programmers. Those who use text editors. <laughs> Yay, that's me. <laughs> and those who use fancy IDEs. <laughs> JetBrains developer there. Good for you. And God made a wonderful, beautiful garden for programmers, and he populated with all sorts of amazing things that helped them solve real-world business problems. <laughs> Free Wi-Fi, immutable data, and recursion, lambdas, parametric polymorphism, algebraic data types, higher-kinded types, and even ML modules. That one's for Odersky. But then one day, one of the programmers called Adam, Adam was his name, was walking in this garden and he saw a serpent and he saw an apple. And Adam became very suspicious. He saw this floating thing above the serpent's head. And that doesn't normally happen with serpents, so he was very cautious. But the serpent was very friendly, and he asked Adam, What do you see there? And Adam said, I see an apple. But the serpent said, Is it really an apple, or is it a fruit? I guess it's a fruit too, said Adam. Is it really a fruit? Or is it a plant, said the serpent. It's not an animal, Adam reasoned, so I guess it must be a plant. Is it really a plant, the serpent said, or is it a thing which has seeds? And Adam couldn't argue with that. I suppose it has seeds, he said. Is it a thing which has seeds, or is it a thing which has a state of being eaten or whole, said the serpent. It definitely has a state of being eaten or whole, said Adam. 
And the apple may change as you eat it, may it not? Said the serpent. If I eat the apple, it will definitely change, said Adam. And the apple is the receiver of being eaten, is it not? (laughs) That's not not true, (laughs) said Adam. And before long, Adam's eyes were transfixed. He could imagine massive object-oriented hierarchies filled with mutable state, and he fell in love with this natural, intuitive, obvious paradigm, so obvious even a baby could tell you that an apple is a fruit and a plant and it had seeds. Fast forward to many, many, many years later, after the consequences of Adam's fall totally destroyed programming kind. What? (laughs) How did that slide get in there? I I have no idea. Let's let's ignore it. So Oop rose to new heights and became the dominant paradigm of the 20th century, even the 21st century, actually. But then something strange happened. Object-oriented programmers began to say funny things like, favor composition over inheritance. Stop inheriting, start composing. And they said things like favor immutable data over mutable data. And then they started adding lambdas to all their object-oriented programming languages. They even brought parametric polymorphism into their object-oriented programming languages and called it generics. And today, the number one programming language in the world is actually not an object-oriented programming language. It's a prototypical scripting language by the name of JavaScript with first-class closures, first-class lambdas. It's not a good language by any means, (laughs) but it does say something that's a non-object-oriented programming language is now the number one programming language in the world. All right, so let's talk now about the Ten Commandments of Beautiful Scholar. And the backdrop for this is going to be a library that I work on called Zio. You couldn't escape Zio in this presentation, I'm sorry. <laughs> so Zio is a very lightweight zero dependency library that helps you build high, perpor- high performance, type safe, concurrent, and asynchronous applications that don't leak any resources. They're very easy to reason about and reason about in a compositional fashion, and test compositionally, and then refactor without changing their meaning. So I'm gonna give you basically a whirlwind tour of Zio and show you how we can use software like Zio. It doesn't have to be Zio. There's lots of good libraries out there in the Scala ecosystem that really use the power of functional programming to help solve business problems. Could be any library like that. I'm gonna show you how you can use libraries like Zio to write really beautiful Scala that solves the business problems you have at work. Commandment number one, thou shalt program only with functions. So what is a function? Well, a function, number one, is total, which means that for every input you give it, it has to give you an output of a specified type. So there are lots of functions out there which are partial, and then there are lots of functions out there that are total. The the partial ones actually embedded in their type signature is a lie. List.head, for example, claims that it's gonna give you the head of the list, but it won't in all cases. It's gonna throw an exception. It's a partial function. Total functions are those that don't lie. You give them an A, and they always, always give you a B. Functions are also deterministic. That means if you give them the same A, you get back the same B. And deterministic functions make it a lot easier to reason about our software. And finally, functions have only one effect. They compute a return value. Computing that return value can consume memory and it can consume CPU, but that's the only thing it's allowed to do. If it does more than that, if it does more than computing a return value, then it's not a function, it's a side effect. So what are some practical benefits we get out of functions? Well, 
One is reliable refactoring. So there are four types of refactorings actually popularized by object-oriented programmers, which help us maintain our software over time. And they're introduced var, inline var, introduce function, and inline function. Introduce var just means if you have a duplicated expression, you can pull that out into a variable in order to eliminate the duplication. Inline var happens when you're only using a variable once, so you decide to inline it. Introduce function happens when you have some logic that's dependent on some variables, and you want to pull that out into a reusable function so you can eliminate the duplicated logic. An inline function happens when you want to go the other way because you're only using that function a single time. These refactorings that you all take for granted, they can actually only be applied to pure code. If your code is not pure, then applying any of these refactorings change the meaning of the software. We'll see some examples later. Another benefit of functions, programming with functions, is that your types don't lie. So if you see something like the code rec, and it promises to be able to give you a request from any JSON value, that's a lie. That is telling you a lie. If you see something like head of list, that's a lie, because it can't give you an A for any list. It can only give you an A for some types of lists. Or if you see a function that can promise to give you a URL out of any old string, well, that's a lie. It can't possibly be satisfied. So these types are lying to you. And as developers, it's, we spend most of our time studying software. It's really nice to have the property that when you look at a type, it's not lying. You can take it, take it to the bank. And that's true of all pure functions. You can count on those types. They tell you the truth. Also, the types are transparent in that not only do they tell you the truth, but they tell you the whole story. Because remember, functions don't have side effects. So the only thing they do is computing a value of the return type. So you can look at a type, and it, com it conveys a compression of, of the information in the implementation of that function. You're actually looking at an approximation of the behavior in the function by reading that type. And that's not true in the world of non-functions. You see something like partial function any to unit, and who knows? Who knows what that does? It can do anything at all. Whereas in the world of pure functional programming, you see a type and you, and you have some idea of exactly what it does. You have boundaries on what it can and cannot do. One of the most underappreciated benefits of programming with functions is that it inverts control to the caller. You can hand something to some other piece of code, it can't do anything at all other than compute a return value. You could choose to ignore that return value if you want. But nothing you pass it, it can't modify anything you pass it. All that's immutable, and it can only return a value. So it means you, as the caller of code, have total control, which simplifies the way you reason about software. You don't have to worry about people getting a hold of your stuff and doing crazy things, because it simply can't happen. So you always have control, so you need to study code bases less when you're going into making modification or may, maybe writing some new code. Commandment number two, thou shalt reify thy effects. What do I mean by that? I mean by that that functional programming solves the effect problem as follows. Instead of doing stuff in the real world, we actually build data structures that describe the operations of interacting with the real world. So functional programs they don't actually interact with the real world. They, they build what are basically programs, which are data structures that describe interaction with the real world. In this slide, you can see a very simple data structure called console A. Console A represents a program that returns an A, but along the way, it, it can print out stuff to the console and it can read lines in from the console. This is a pure data structure. There are no effects. Everything is immutable. This is immutable. A console of A is an immutable value that represents a program which will return an A and possibly do some other effects along the way. And once you define map, map and flat map for this structure, which are very trivial to do, you can then write a program using a for comprehension. And the program returned here doesn't do anything. It's just a value, just like list. But it does describe those operations. And this allows you to build up entire programs in a purely functional way. And then at the edge of your application, like in your main function, of course, 
you have to take this data structure and you have to interpret it into real world effects. And that part's not functional, but the rest of your program can be purely functional. That's how we do it in FP. And Zio introduces a type called IO, which allows you to do pure functional effects, but more than that, it actually gives you a new power. So ordinarily in programs, effects are second class things. Over on the left hand side, you have a bunch of statements. Those statements are not a value. You can't pass them around to functions. You can't return them from functions. You can't do refactoring on them because statements are, are some other weird construct. They're not like expressions. You can't use all the machinery that you're an expert in on statements because they're something else. They're, they're not values. And what a library like Zio lets you do is turn all of those statements into ordinary values. Now you have a program over here, which is an ordinary immutable value, and you can apply all your, all your normal refactorings. You can build functions out of these things. You can pass these values to other functions and return them from functions. So you've turned what was a second class effect into a first class effect and opened up all your standard machinery to this new type of effect. So IO of EA, it represents an immutable value that describes an effectful program which could either fail with an E or at some point return an A. And this is the core data type in Zio that lets you model effectful interaction with the real world. It allows you to safely interact with Java code, with legacy Scala code, with any type of non-functional code. You can very easily interact with that but do it in, in the context of a purely functional application. IO of nothing A represents a value that never fails. IO of E nothing represents a value that never returns. And IO of nothing nothing represents a value that never fails or returns. It's like a server that just keeps on spinning or a while true loop. One of the most amazing things that programming in this style lets you do is build program combinators. That is, you can write ordinary functions that take programs and combine them into other programs. This is a phenomenal capability. Over on the left-hand side, you can see some code that tries to, for a very specific function, network request, it tries to create some re retry logic. That This is done with Scala's ordinary future that's in the standard library and, and which is not a functional construct. And over on the right-hand side, you can see that using Zio's IO, we're able to create a retry combinator that operates on that program. So it takes any, any type of program, IO of EA, and it returns a new program of IO EA. And that new program retries the old one with the specified parameters. The ability to treat your programs as values and build combinators that combine them lets you extract out duplication across the sort of macroscopic structure of your program. and means functional programming can allow you to say a lot more with a lot less duplication. Also, I.O. opens up God mode. What do I mean by that? Well, remember I.O. is just a data structure. At the end of the day, it doesn't do anything. A function that returns an I.O. literally just builds a value. So you have to interpret that into the set of effects that it models at, at the edge of your application, your main function. And you do that using an unsafe run function. And as you are doing that unsafe run, you're peering into that data structure and looking at all the cases. It gives you the ability to weave in arbitrary effects that are not supported by the host programming language. You can do magic because you've basically built your own programming language and interpreter in the host language. So you can add features like seamless asynchronous programming, easy concurrency that's safe, resource safety, program interruption. You can do fibers instead of real threads for, for much more scalability. You could do supervisions. You can monitor all errors and, and report them system-wide across your entire application. These are features that you, that you can't get out of Java or Scala because the designers of those languages didn't bake them in. But when you're programming an I.O., when you're programming in a world in which everything is a value, you have the ability to interpret that I.O. in any way you see fit. And so you can add truly powerful capabilities that have the potential to solve problems you have in the business. Number three, thou shalt not block threads. In this day and age, we know the correct solution to high performance 
um, programming is asynchronicity. We write asynchronous programs that don't block threads. Whenever we can, we can do so. Obviously, with JDBC, we still have to block threads. There's a few things like that. But even JDBC is in the process of producing an asynchronous version of that. So at some point in the next five years, there, you will be able to write an application with zero blocking code of any kind. Zio has a fiber-based concurrency model, which is quite different than the JVM's thread-based concurrency model. Every JVM thread maps to an operating system thread. Whereas Zio has this notion of fiber, which is you can consider it a green thread, a very lightweight green thread that's implemented inside Zio. Every fiber has its own stack and its own interpreter and so forth. And as it's going over there, it has the ability to execute the I.O. program using its own stack space and, and so forth. And this allows you to run tons and tons of fibers on a single JVM thread, which opens up the door to massive scalability. Zio has asynchronicity built in, which means that you never have to resort to callbacks. Over on the left-hand side is the typical sort of callback API that populates a lot of the Java APIs. You never have to use anything like that anymore. You can write your code on the right-hand side. And yes, you have to use that for comprehension. You have to get used to this whole flat map map thing. But once you do that, the code on the right-hand side is much easier to understand than the code on the left-hand side. And you can chain those things as, as long as you want, and it's all totally flat. Whereas when you're using callback style, you get increasing levels of nesting that gets very, very unmanageable, especially as you attempt to pass information from outermost layers or innermost layers to outermost layers. Fibers give you the ability to scale up way beyond native operating system level threads. So green threads are actually better, but green threads require support in the language, and Java doesn't have that. Neither does Scala. So fibers are about the best you can do, which is a green thread implemented in a library. And you can routinely achieve 100,000 or more concurrent fibers on modern hardware without, without breaking a sweat. And possibly even more, possibly even a million, depending on how active they are, because most of these are powered by async operations. Whereas threads, the upper limit for scalability is around 10,000 threads at the same time. And even there, you see a lot of context switching overhead. In this example, it shows using Zio to take a program, load tester. Remember, everything in Zio is, is a value. IO is, is a program, but it's also a value. And it fills a list 10,000 times, 100,000 times, I don't know. And um, it just runs all of those at the same time. One of the other interesting things about fibers is that they can actually be garbage collected. You can have a fiber that runs infinitely that if it's not doing any work at the present moment in time and there's no way for anyone to reach it, to add more work into it, then it will be garbage collected. So unlike threads, which have to be shut down and managed carefully, especially when they're running in infinite loops, fibers can run in infinite loops and still be garbage collected, which means fewer leaks. Commandment four, thou shalt not leak resources. Java and Scala give us try finally as a way of making sure we don't leak resources because no matter what happens in the try, the finally block will be executed. So we can open files in, in uh, the try block and we can close them in the finally block and that gives us a guarantee that we won't leak resources. The problem, however, is it only applies to synchronous code. Try finally doesn't work for async code. And Zio gives us a method called ensuring that works with either synchronous or asynchronous actions. So now you have try finally, but across async regions of your code. In fact, even your finalizer could have async regions. Try finally is often used to manage resources. So we'll open a file, and then in the finally block, we'll close it. And this pattern is so common, it's encapsulated into a method called bracket in Zio which lets you open a file and then atomically close that file no matter what happens when you're using that resource. And, and if you use bracket to manage all your resources, you have a guarantee that no resources can leak from your application.
And finally, one of the really interesting things is that the Java and Scala error model are broken. Because if you have the right combinations of try, finally, and catches, you can actually throw many exceptions, and then you're only able to catch one of them. So all the other ones are lost. They're swallowed into a black hole. And the one that you catch is actually the wrong one. It's not the primary cause of the failure. So the fundamental error model baked into Scala and Java is, is broken and makes it hard to diagnose problems. Whereas over on the right-hand side, you have an example of the same situation modeled in Zeo. First off, the naive attempt to do that won't even compile. The types won't let you write that. If you sneak in a thrown exception somewhere, however, in the second example over on the right-hand side, then you'll, all the errors will still be reported. So e even though you, you're only able to catch one error, the other ones will be reported to what, what's called the fiber's unhandled error handler, which you have full control over, and you can send those errors to log or whatever. The point is they, they don't get lost. And like try and, and finally, finalizers uh, cannot be stopped. And what that means is if you have nested finalizers and one of them fails for some sort of catastrophic reason, the ones on the outside will still be run and in the correct order. Which means if you have a buggy finalizer and, and it's going to leak some resource, unfortunately that happens, you'll leak the minimum amount of resources because all the other finalizers will be run on the way out in the correct order. Thou shalt not fear concurrency. Concurrency can be a terrifying topic, but there are ways using FP to make it very simple. So let's take a look at them. Zio has a primitive called race, which lets you take two I.O. actions and race them and get back the winner. And it really is that simple. You just call, here's your one I.O., your other I.O., you call race. In fact, you can even use race. You can, you can attempt some action and race that with another one, which nearly waits 30 seconds and fails in order to implement timeout. So these primitives are compositional. And then if you want to race a whole bunch of things, well, there's race all. You can take in you know, 100, 1,000 things. You want to get back the winner from a thousand-way race. It's as simple as calling race all. Parallelism, too. When you, when, you, when you don't just need the first answer that comes back, but you need all the answers that comes back, then you need parallelism. And the primary combinator there is a combinator called par. So you have one I.O. and another I.O., and you just call I.O. 1 par I.O. 2. Done. Now they both execute in parallel. And you get back both results together. There's no locking, there's no blocking of any type. This is 100% asynchronous and, and built using the very high performance fiber concurrency model. And maybe you need to loop over a whole list of stuff and perform some action for every item in that list, and you want to do that in parallel. Well, that's as easy as calling for each the parallel version of for each. And then finally, if you have a whole bunch of IOs and you've got them in a list or somewhere, and you want to do them all in parallel, that's as easy as calling par all. So this enables you to use parallelism, basically max out your CPU cores without even having to think about concepts like threads and locks, or even fibers. You don't even have to know about fibers. You just call these very simple operations that have strong guarantees that we'll explore later and you get back the answer you expect. Six, thou shalt rest as much as possible, not just on Sunday. So la laziness matters to modern applications. We build our applications, and we want to do stuff in parallel because we want to get back results quickly, and we want to use cores. But also at the same time, sometimes one failure will lead to a cascade of failures. And, and we can't return any results at all. And rather than executing all the stuff that was going in parallel, we want to just kill them. Like, we want to stop them from executing instantaneously and clean up all resources. Now, that's not possible, really, in, in the world of Java, imperative Java, or even imperative Scala. It can't be done. But in the world of pure functional programming, we have the ability to do something called interruption. So when you fork a fiber, when you fork an I.O. to run in a separate fiber, then you get back a thing called the fiber. And it represents a handle on that green thread. And that handle on that green thread, you can do a couple things with it. Like the fork join framework in Java, the fork join thread pool. 
you can fork and you can join. You can join a fiber if you want to await its result. Um, but you can also interrupt a fiber if you're done with it and don't care about its result. An interruption in Zeo happens instantaneously. And there's no magic, there's no configuration, there's no explicit user action requires. No matter what kind of code you write, big complex programs, they can all be interrupted instantaneously anywhere in their execution except in very small critical sections used, used by bracket. And that's possible because of the runtime system, which looks at that I.O. data structure and interprets it step by step. That's not possible in imperative programs. You would have to add, in between every statement of your Java program, you would have to add a call to some sort of checker that would do all these different things for you, which is just so impractical, no one would ever do it. So this is a benefit that, is, that can only, only, only be found in the realm of pure functional programs. This allows you to do amazing things like timing out any action inside your entire application. So ordinarily, things like HTTP clients have timeouts, which is great. But imagine if you could take any effectful function in your entire application and time it out. And the API is very simple. You just call timeout 60 seconds or whatever. And you can do that with any computation. And, and the resulting savings can be phenomenal. So if you await a future for five seconds, and it's really going to take two hours, then even when await returns, it's still going to be executing for five hours, consuming all those resources, and doing socket operations, network operations, file operations, database operations, sucking up CPU and memory and network bandwidth. Whereas if you do the same thing in Zio, you time out something after five seconds, then after five seconds, that five hour long computation is terminated and all its resources are cleaned up. You did not have to write any code to take advantage of that, and it works everywhere. Racing 2 is extraordinarily lazy about how much computation it performs. You race a bunch of things in parallel. As soon as you have a winner determined, all the other losers will be instantaneously interrupted. If you try the same thing with future, using future first completed of, you'll find they all run to completion. You can't stop them. So even though it seems like you're getting back one thing from 10, really you're just paying attention to one thing while all 10 are running until whenever they would have terminated normally. And finally, parallelism. Zio is very, very lazy about parallelism as well. If you're trying to do five things in parallel and you need all five results and one of them fails, well, it doesn't matter. You shouldn't let the other ones complete. You should terminate them instantaneously to save all those resources. And that's exactly what Zio does. So without you having to think, you use these base combinators. And then suddenly you have extraordinarily efficient programs that do the minimal computation possible. And they do that in a way that is resource safe because they don't leak resources when they interrupt things. Thou shalt honor thy transactions. So in modern applications, especially Java applications, there's so much mutable state, and different threads are trying to update it at the same time. And what we really need is the ability to update that mutable shared state atomically. And so in Java, it's very common to use things like locks. And so you have lots of locks everywhere, and that leads to deadlocks and slow performance and blocking code. But in Zio, we have something called ref, which is a mutable cell that contains a reference to an A that can be atomically updated. And it's very simple to use. In this case, I create uh, 100 update programs by filling the list with a single program that increments a value by a single number. And I run them all in parallel against a single ref. They all have the guarantee that they'll see a consistent state when they perform that update. So it's like everyone is isolated to a transaction. And there are no locks. This is implemented using a very fast compare and swap operation, which is actually baked into all your CPUs these days. And if you want to do effectful updates, which is the more actor-like story, where yes, you have some shared mutable state, but for every different command or message you, you want to actually execute effect, you have something called refm. And this lets you do the same thing. You can call update. Only every single update is allowed to return an I.O. or is, is you can pass in an effectful program into every single update. All of them will be done in parallel, 
but the results will be sequenced in, in such a fashion that they only touch the state um, at different times, and so you end up with a consistent state at the end. Eight, thou shalt fulfill thy promises. So many times we need to pass information between fibers, and promise can help us do that. It's a very simple construct. We can make a promise, and then we can hand that promise off to some other computation. And we ourselves can call promise get. It's a, it's a little unclear, but it's, it's right there. We can call promise get, and then some other code can complete the promise very similar to the promise in, in Scala. And this allows us to communicate between fibers and to do fiber to fiber signaling. We can solve all sorts of problems in a lockless fashion using this construct called promise. Nine, thou shalt not give up. So Zio has a way for you to do retries and repeats called schedule. And what schedule is, is schedule of A, B, it's an immutable value like everything in Zio that describes an effectful schedule. And what happens is the schedule consumes values of type A and emits values of type B. Every time it emits a value of type B, it can decide whether to continue the schedule or to terminate it. And if it decides to continue, it can specify a certain delay to wait. And this allows you to do both retries, should you repeat a program that failed to sum E, so the inputs to the schedules are E's in that case. Or should you repeat a program that returned an A? So the inputs to the schedule are the values computed by the, the task that you're repeating. And they look like that. So schedule can function either as a retry policy or as a repeat policy. It just depends on what the meaning of those type parameters is. And the API for using these is extraordinarily simple. On any I.O., you can call retry and give it a schedule and get back a new I.O. that applies that schedule. And the same way for repeat. If you want to repeat something, right, report generation or logging or whatever, user email notifications, you just call repeat on that task and you give it the schedule. The schedules, there's a, a small number of base cases and then there are combinators that allow you to combine schedules to create composite schedules. And together, they allow you to solve virtually any problem you can imagine in schedule. This particular one does uh, exponential, starting from 10 milliseconds and scaling up from then for as long as the duration is less than 60 seconds. And then after it's done with that one, it switches over to a schedule that does fixed repeats at 60 second intervals, but will only go up to 100 times. And then it jitters that schedule, so it adds some random amount of delay to the delays produced by that schedule and then it just collects all the inputs so this would be useful for some sort of distributed scenario in which you're hitting a web API and, and you need to uh, use exponential back off combined with uh, jittering and then the final commandment is thou shalt be fruitful and multiply thy data so in modern applications especially Scala there's so much data moving around and so much of our job is just moving data, rearranging data, calling, pulling data out of APIs and databases and pushing data into other systems. So our programs need to be except, exceptionally adept at handling data. And uh, uh, where, where would FP be if it didn't provide you any tools? Zio provides you two tools to deal with data. The first one is a back-pressured queue. And in a back-pressured queue, it's a very simple API, basically just has take and offer, so you can stick something in the queue and get something out of the queue. But the, but the neat thing with a back-pressured queue is that if the producers exceed the capacity of the consumers, then the producers will be slowed down automatically. This is something that happens without any configuration, basically for free. Which means if you build your entire application out of back-pressured queues, then you never need to worry about producers going too fast for consumers. Producers will go as fast as they can and fill up these big buffers, but when they start going too fast or consumers start going too slow, then the producers will be slowed down automatically. And then I wanted to give folks a sneak peek of something that is not in Zio currently but we'll be in Zio two weeks from now, which is a new version of Scala Z Stream. So Scala Z Stream has been dead for 
four years or something. That was the last commit. And this is the new version of that. And it's designed to be very focused on a set of use cases that, that dominates certain types of streaming applications, very fast, impossible to leak resources from, extremely good type inference, and an API that just looks like ordinary collections. So this is gonna allow you to do very high performance streaming. And it's actually powered. This type of stream would not even be possible if it weren't for a single feature in Zio that actually was very controversial at the time. So this is a new type of stream. I'm very excited about the, the potential of, of this stream. And if you eliminate all the type annotations on this, which I just showed you for your own benefit, you get something that looks like this, which is very straightforward and fairly easy to understand if you've done any work with streams. All right, closing exhortations for beautiful Scala. First off, if you want to learn more about Zio, then please head over to their repository. There's a microsite for that. There's a chat room, and there's a chat room for Scala Z. And I hang out on all these places, and I'm on the GitHub site a lot. So if you have any questions, just open up an issue. I'm more than happy to help. I think we have some Zio contributors in the audience. Anyone done a Zio pull request or yay, yay, go. <laughs> I see we am back there too. So yeah, there's there's people who will help you out and, and the library is rapidly growing. There's a ton of contributors right now. We can always use more. Documentation keeps getting better. It's deployed in production at many companies um, and has no dependencies, works with all the cat's effect stuff, works interops with future and, and all the stuff built on, on top of that. So head on over there to learn more. And also, I, I want to leave you with this thought, that functional programming, when done right, has a lot of value. The way we're doing functional programming these days is not like the early days of Scala Z when all we had was the crazy looking, you know, that operator and all these crazy operators. Uh, we're, we're trying to deliver value in these functional libraries. We're trying to solve business problems in a way that you cannot solve them using imperative software. And I know it's a bit different. It's a bit different to program in a for comprehension versus using statements. But these are differences you can learn about. And we have a great community. How many people here know some functional programming? Yeah, look. And how many of you who know functional programming would be willing to help someone who, who needed help? Yeah. So look, at, look, we're all in this together. And um, this is a great group of people. The Scala community is a great place to be in because people will help you understand these things. So if you see some of these features and they solve a problem at your work and you get excited about it, then just you know, grab someone, grab me, grab someone. We will take the time to explain to you the difference between for comprehension style and statement style. We'll, t we'll take the time to explain things like monads and other types of things. And, and, and you too, can benefit from all the amazing work that's being done inside these functional programming libraries. Um, it may be a little scary, um, but don't let anyone tell you you can't do it, because you can do it. I know you can do it. Many of you have already done it, and many of you will, will learn FP and become masters of FP in, in the coming months and years. So thank you so much for attending this talk. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me Apologies, I got sick along the way. That's why I barely have a voice. Um, thank you to the sponsors for making conferences like Scala IO possible. Um, this is a great conference and so affordable and just packed with lots of amazing content. And I've had many wonderful conversations. So thanks to the sponsors and, and everyone else who made this conference so memorable.